So let's jump in. Uh, Ayman El Zwahawi was finally killed. God, it took them a long time. Finally killed. It's only taken 21 years for them to get this monster. Um, it's it's it, the more you analyze and 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 you read about the history, the more horrific it is. And even we'll talk about how they killed him. Even how they killed him is is such a a sign of I think such a sign of weakness. Uh, but w w we will talk about that. So let's first talk about who he was. Uh, of course, Elzwa here he was was number two. Uh, Bin Laden's number two in Al Qaeda. When Bin Laden was murdered, he became number one. Uh, but his history goes back quite a bit. Uh, Zawahiri is an Egyptian. He, um, he was born to a, a very affluent, very well-educated family in uh, Giza, in, um, in Egypt. Um, his uh, his uh, family uh, both generated significant religious leaders within Egyptian society in the past, going back to his grandfather uh, and... Uh, also, uh, doctors and and, uh, and and a you know very uh, very well educated um, uh, family. He uh, uh, he studied to be a doctor, became a doctor. So uh, practiced medicine here and there. He actually, when he met Bin Laden in the 1980s, he actually served as Bin Laden's doctor for many years. Swahili in his youth was uh, radicalized uh, radicalized by the Muslim Brotherhood. And now, if, if you're interested in the Muslim Brotherhood, if you're interested in the history of Islamism, of the whole radical totalitarian Islam, then I highly recommend my course on, I have a course, I can't remember how many parts, four, four lectures, four or five lectures on the history of Islamic totalitarianism, on Islamism, uh, on, uh, on jihadism. It goes back to the history of the Muslim Brotherhood. It goes. Uh, it, it describes the rise of uh, other various Islamist movements, including ultimately Al Qaeda, and I think we cover ISIS. It's just the beginning of ISIS, um, but you can find that on YouTube uh, for free. So uh, go check out the videos. Um, I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, you're not going to get. I don't think you're going to get a better succinct uh, perspective on the Islamist movement anywhere else. Uh, on video, as far as I know, M maybe there's something out there that's better, but it's it's I can't remember if it's three, four, five lectures, but it's pretty short, and and you'll get a complete history, including the 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 revolution in Iran and the importance of the revolution in Iran uh, for the rise of of organizations like Al Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it's on my channel. It's also on the Airway channel, but it's on my channel. It's audio only, but it is on my YouTube channel. It's also on the podcast channel. Uh, in the past somewhere, so you can find all of that. You know, the other course that it gives you even a bigger, broader perspective, context for all of this is the one I did on the history of the Middle East um, that is also on YouTube and uh, available for free. I think you'll really enjoy that. Again, it's, it's I don't know where you're going to get a, uh, a better, short, succinct, to the point, essentialized, history of the Middle East. Uh, so it's probably your best resource for something like that. So use that. It, you know, it's on my website. It's on YouTube for free out there. Um, I should probably uh, share it on Twitter more often. But, uh, but please, go in and, uh, and watch it and let me know what you think. Anyway, uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was an organization in Egypt dedicated to uh, a global Islamic revolution. It was, it was uh, founded in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, the uh, the founders were ultimately, uh, you know, it was in combat with the Egyptian authorities throughout. Uh, it it had its kind of ebbs and flows um, uh, throughout the decades. And uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood, just to give you, just in more recent times, when there was the Arab Spring, in what was it, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, the Arab Spring led ultimately to the Muslim Brotherhood taking to the streets, dominating the conversation, and ultimately winning the Egyptian elections and taking power democratically in Egypt, uh, failing dramatically, and, in, and then ultimately being deposed and being replaced by the current regime, which is basically an authoritarian regime, but a secular one. The Muslim Brotherhood are very popular in Egypt, 
widespread support, membership in the Muslim Brotherhood is, is widespread, even though uh, over the years uh, they have periodically, and I don't know what the status is right now, but they have periodically been um, a band, uh, they have periodically been outlawed, and yet they continue to exist. They continue to thrive, one would argue. Anyway, at the age 14, Al-Zawahiri uh, joined the Muslim Brotherhood. He was particularly inspired by a particular uh, writer for the Muslim Brotherhood, a writer that I talk about in uh, my course on the rise of totalitarian Islam, a writer by the name of Said Qutb, one of the most important figures in the rise of Islamism uh, in, um, over the last 100 years. Uh, Said Qutb was uh, executed by the uh, Nasser regime in Egypt in 1960, I think in 1968, um, but, but in the 60s, in the mid to late 60s, uh, as, uh, as uh, Nasser rounded up the Muslim Brotherhood and outlawed the organization. Said Qud was a, was a very charismatic, very influential, um, uh, I don't know what to call him, right? Thinker, uh, intele inte uh, Islamist, intellectual, he had visited the United States, had hated America, he is really the one within the Islamist movement to first uh, identify uh, the United States as, as essentially the enemy. He hated the United States because it was secular. He, he believed that even Christianity in the United States had basically been secularized, and that secular and the, the secular and secular America was the enemy of Islam. It, 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 you know, one of the things that really horrified him when he was in America and he went, he went to a church dance and he saw men and women dancing together in church and he found that idea as truly horrific and a sign of the complete um, uh, degener degeneracy of American society. And he writes about this extensively and he, he spent a lot of time in jail and he spent a lot of time writing in jail and he became one of the most influential characters, certainly Bin Laden and, and many of the Al-Qaeda and many of the radicalized Islamists that came on in the 80s and 90s all read Said Qutb, all were inspired by him, all studied him carefully. Uh, so he is one of the theological inspirations for the modern Islamic movement. Anyways, Zawahiri uh, joined the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the following year, uh, Said Qutb was, was executed. Uh, you know, and following that execution, uh, Zawahiri kind of started an underground cell devoted to the overthrowing of the government and the Islamic of a, a, a establishment of Islamic State. Uh, as he grew older, he became more involved. Ultimately, if you were spinning off of the Muslim Brotherhood, it was too uh, dedicated to political change. It was too dedicated to long-term change. He wanted now, he wanted militant, he wanted violence. Um, and he landed up um, merging, joining his little organization with the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which by the early 1980s, he was basically the head of. The big event in the early 1980s in Egypt was the assassination of President Sadat. President Sadat was the, uh, was the guy who uh, uh, took over the, was an was a authoritarian um, dictator of Egypt following uh, Nasser, um, he had uh, launched Egypt into a war with Israel in 1973. But then in 1970, God, I might get my, my years off by a year or two. But 1979, I think, um, had come to the conclusion that it was not in Egypt's interest to be at war with Israel, that, Israel had, that Egypt had very little to gain from this war, that it wasn't really fighting for anything that it really valued. And he basically unilaterally called out for peace with Israel, which was incredibly unpopular. He, at the same time, also was working uh, throughout the 1970s to slowly secularize uh, Egyptian society. He also, uh, after 1973 war, which Egypt, which uh, in spite of Egypt's uh, great advantage, uh, it, it was a surprise attack. It gained a lot of advantage in the first few days. Ultimately, it landed up losing big time, and, and Israel landed up being not too far from Cairo. Um, so here we realized that uh, part of what made him weak, part of what made Egypt weak, was his alliance with the Soviet Union, 
with the Russians. Um, and as a consequence, not Zawahiri, uh, Sadat realized this. As a consequence, Sadat uh, kicked out the Russians uh, during the 1970s, uh, moved closer to the United States, uh, declared his interest in having peace with Israel, started secularizing Egyptian society, and actually, in, a, in, a, in one of the great acts of courage of any politician that, that I've seen while I've been alive, actually came to Jerusalem and stood in front of Israeli parliament and expressed his interest, his willingness, his commitment to a, a, a peace treaty with, uh, with Israel. Ultimately, that peace treaty was signed uh, with Jimmy Carter and, and uh, Begin and Sadat, with Jimmy Carter witnessing. Um, and uh, as a consequence, somewhat of the peace treaty with Israel, but I would say even more so, uh, as a consequence of his um, secularization of Egyptian society, a move, a strong move towards greater secularization of Egyptian society, uh, he had a bullseye on his back, and um, he suspected he was going to be killed, and as a consequence, 1,500 uh, Islamists uh, were rounded up um, and imprisoned, among them uh, Zwahiri. Uh, but he had missed a cell, a cell that was actually within his military, uh, within the military, in the Egyptian military. And during a military parade, this unit, which was parading in front of him, suddenly broke rank, uh, ran towards where the president was sitting, and shot him dead. Um, Zwahiri, while in jail uh, during this period, um, it, you know, uh, they accused him of being part of the assassination. Uh, they accused him of being part of the cell. But ultimately, uh, some rumors say that he cooperated and handed in some high-ranking um, Islamists. Uh, so ultimately, the Egyptians uh, accused him of, I don't know, uh, uh, weapon charges or something like that, left him in jail for three years, and released him in 1984. So, so he was released in 1984. He goes to Pakistan. Um, and uh, ultimately, and uh, there he meets uh, bin Laden. This is at the time where uh, there is a call for jihad in Afghanistan. All these uh, Islamists are, are going to Pakistan and then launching attacks against the Russians from Pakistan into Afghanistan, all in the name of jihad, all in the name of getting the, the uh, atheistic communists out of Afghanistan. Uh, so Zwahiri uh, latches on or becomes uh, very close to bin Laden and from that point on is affiliated and associated uh, with bin Laden. It, it, it is interesting that, uh, in spite of this, he, he managed to visit the United States in the early uh, nineteen uh, in the early nineteen nineties. Uh, I think in nineteen ninety three, um, he, he addressed several mosques in California. Um, even though, I, well, I guess at this point, Al Qaeda, or at least what was the previous version of Al Qaeda when it was fighting the Russians. Um, was considered an ally, but uh, of course, soon after that, Al Qaeda is involved in, in terrorist attacks primarily, uh, starting in the late 1990s, 1998, U.S. embassy bombing in Kenya and Tanzania, where hundreds of people were killed, um, and uh, you know he was uh, he was indicted for that in absentia. It was indicted, and uh, uh, and then in 2000, the bombing of the U.S. coal. Uh, again, uh, he, was, uh, he was deemed to be one of the planners of that. And to a large extent, uh, it's quite clear that um, he might have been the mastermind, if not one of the masterminds, behind the 9-11 attacks. Um, he was on a list of, of the, top, um, the top most wanted terrorists uh, in the world by the United States. Now, since 2001, since 9-11, 2001, supposedly the United States has been after and trying to murder him and kill him. Uh, kill him, not murder him. I mean, this would be an act of self-defense. Um, he is um, he is a uh, uh, he has been leading Al Qaeda since Bin Laden's death. As I said, he's been number two. He's been very much the spokesman. Um, he is uh, very much an organizer. He's really. Uh, being suspected for a long time to be kind of the intellect behind 
the charismatic uh, Bin Laden. On several occasions, it is said, uh, the United States had a clear shot at killing him. Certainly in the direct aftermath of 9-11, this is true both of him and in Bin Laden. They didn't take the shot because they were afraid of collateral damage. Um, on one occasion when they did sh uh, uh, shoot, when they thought he was there, I think one of his wives and children uh, were, actually, were actually killed. Uh, but the United States has had lots of opportunities, lots of opportunities to kill Bin Laden, lots of opportunities to kill Zawahiri, uh, particularly, again, in the months after 9-11. They didn't take it because of um, the fear of... Um, of uh, collateral damage, of civilian casualties, uh, which is horrific. This is a guy who didn't care about collateral damage of civilian casualties. He targeted civilians, killed as many as necessary in America in defending itself, in defending itself by killing somebody who was continuously planning to attack America, uh, you know, refrained from doing it. Even the bomb that killed him um, what was it, a few days ago, even that bomb was a bomb that was, uh, that, that, that is, that is um, very low impact. So it creates very little damage. Uh, I mean, this is kind of the technology that we have today. They, they, they literally noticed him on the balcony and uh, sent a, a missile that would kill him on the balcony and pretty much not harm anybody else in the building. Now, he was in a building, in a home, in Kabul, in Afghanistan, in a, uh, in a very large home, in a very, very, very lucrative neighborhood, the richest neighborhood in Kabul, uh, not far from many of the uh, foreign embassies, or at least were foreign embassies, before uh, the foreigners evacuated as the, uh, as, uh, the Taliban took control. Uh, it's interesting that it was in Afghanistan, not surprising at all, but interesting. Partially because the peace agreement that the Taliban signed with uh, Donald Trump, Trump promised us, committed to us, that uh, the Taliban had promised not to work with terrorist organizations and not to harbor terrorists like Zawahiri. And here we are, the head of al-Qaeda at the heart of Kabul, in the heart of Afghanistan. And as far as we can tell, Arabs... Uh, remember, the Afghans are not Arabs. The Arabs who are coming in from the Middle East are going in and out of his compound, in and out of his house, uh, continuing to plot and plan and, 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 and support terrorist activities probably all over the world. Who knows what he's already put in motion. So this idea that the Taliban is not in league with al-Qaeda, the idea that the Taliban will not support al-Qaeda, will not continue to harbor al-Qaeda, is a joke and is ridiculous. And the idea that the Biden administration, so that's Trump's peace deal. I mean, the idea that you have a peace deal with the Taliban is a travesty, an abomination, and a betrayal of America. Um, but, you know, that's just a, a day in the office for Trump. Uh, but the Biden administration, on the other hand, is saying, look, we left Afghanistan. But we can still hurt them. We can still go in and we can still do this. We can still kill the head of, so he's taking full credit for this. Well, he deserves none. I'm sure the CIA has been working on this for years and months uh, and, and, and has been uh, working to try to ha make this happen for a long, long time. But notice, they used a bomb just to kill him. Nobody else in the house was killed. They haven't attacked any of what I assume are training bases of ISIS and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Uh, they continue to kill one-off leaders here and there. But as far as I can tell, there's no concerted bombing attempt. There's no concerted uh, attempt to destroy al-Qaeda's capabilities uh, now that the Taliban are back in Afghanistan and back allowing, I'm sure. Uh, so the credit and the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Biden is not saying, you see, this vindicates my leaving Afghanistan last year. Now, I'm all for leaving Afghanistan. Um, not the way he, but the way he left was so disgusting, so horrific, so treasonous, so uh, re reflective of American weakness. Just horrific. And for him now to say, see, it's all worked out, no. 
Uh, nothing has worked out. Uh, this, is, this continues to be uh, an example of uh, American capitulation and American weakness, and uh, there's nothing to suggest uh, that American can handle the, uh, uh, if Afghanistan becomes a, a base for terrorism, which it's very, very likely, probably already is, um, uh, a base for terrorism, there's no evidence that the Biden administration has the will or the ability to take care of that. It is interesting, uh, you know, and I don't know the answer to this, but it is interesting to speculate uh, where the drone took off from. I mean, did, did the drone come from um, uh, Pakistan, from a CIA base in Pakistan? The Pakistanis are not going to acknowledge that. They're not going to admit it. Is the drone, um, is the drone a, uh, has, has flying distance enough to be able to have, have come out of a uh, aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean and uh, flown to Afghanistan all that distance, w w hung around until the exact moment where the guy was going to be in the balcony and then shot him? Um, it, did it come from the north, from Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, where the United States has had military bases? Uh, hard to tell. That, that's interesting. It just interests me as a former military intelligence guy. I'd love to know uh, where the drone came from and, um, and, and kind of how it functioned and to what extent was the government of Pakistan uh, aware or to what extent is the government of Pakistan right now freaking out and pissed off because uh, the origins of the drone are probably in Pakistan. But uh, in any case, all of that, I'm sure, is super confidential. And uh, uh, since the government of Pakistan is not going to let the world know if it came from its uh, uh, base on its land, uh, you know, we probably won't know. But, um, um, you know, it is. It, it would be interesting. These are pretty significant missiles, so... It can be a little drone. It's it's a substantial drone. No, who knows? Maybe, maybe the CIA has a base somewhere in the mountains in Afghanistan itself. I mean, it, it really is with, with drones big enough to do this. I doubt that. I think that's too risky. But I wouldn't be surprised if they had a base in a Pakistan. And I I'm pretty sure they have bases in in uh, Tajikistan or in Uzbekistan, in the north of uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, but maybe, maybe it just came off of an aircraft carrier, although then I don't think it would have been characterized as it has been as a CIA operation. Um, so anyway, a lot of interesting kind of military intelligence stuff that I'd love to know, and I'm sure you guys would love to know as well, at least some of you uh, would love to know as well. All right. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.